Berwick Public Library. Tonight's program is very exciting. I want to introduce Steve Carter. He'll be talking about his new book, All Cars Run to Park Street. And in this book, he captures the Boston music scene in the late 60s and equal parts literary romp, love story, and historical fiction. I'd like to have Steve give you a little bit of a background on himself and his writing, and we'll get right to it. Thank you, Steve. All right, thank you, Sharon. <clears throat> uh, thanks for having me. Uh, the book is largely autobiographical, so I'll start there. The main character in the book, uh, Jim, goes to UMass Boston in the late 60s. So um, from that point on, it's pretty much autobiographical. And so when I'm talking tonight about Jim, for the most part, I'm talking about myself. Uh, <clears throat> the book covers just a short period of time, November 1968 till April 26th, actually, in uh, 1969, one day after tax day. There's a lot of uh, political undertones in my book. <clears throat> That's why I picked that day. Uh, I graduated from UMass Boston in 69 with a degree in English and a minor in education. I taught, I was playing uh, music uh, during that time, playing in the clubs in Boston, as you'll hear about during my presentation. Uh, I met Marilyn uh, while I was playing in a club on Newbury Street in uh, the late 60s, and we've been married ever since. Uh, she is the model for Eva in the book. Um, after I graduated from college, I taught guitar in a little music studio for a couple of years, and then I started teaching at Berkeley College Music. Uh, it was a small school in those days, just one building on Boylston Street, uh, and I taught there for 25 years, and of course now Berkeley owns half the city, uh, has places everywhere. Um, <clears throat> I resigned from Berkeley in 1997 after having had enough politics, uh, faculty politics, and i uh, did various jobs after that, and one of them was the, uh, the forum with Marilyn Mott Publishing, which is a small publishing company. We did our, uh, our book event here. We're trying to remember how many years ago, maybe about seven or six or seven years ago. We had published a cookbook, and I had composed and performed music to go with the cookbook. And <clears throat> we did an event here, and Marilyn cooked some food, and everybody got to sample the food, and I played some of the guitar pieces from the recording. Uh, we had published the book through a small publisher that we didn't end up liking, so we wanted to do a second edition of the book, which we did, and we started our own publishing company because we had learned how to do it from going through another publisher. And then people started asking us about self-publishing, and some of the people we met wanted to self-publish their books. So since then, we've published a total of, counting the cookbook, 20 books, and uh, all Cards is the 20th book. And there are two more in the pipeline, maybe three more in the pipeline now. So we continue to do this. Um, so I think that's about all I want to say from my background. I'll get right into the presentation. <coughs> so as I mentioned, Mott Publishing, and there's our website, mottpublishing.net. And you can email me there if you have any questions. And, I will mention that <clears throat> I do have a blog that I've been keeping for many years on the Mott Publishing site. If you look at the menu, you'll see a, it says Writer's Journal. That's my blog. And during uh, the time that I was working on the book, I did a lot of posts about the kind of research I was doing and how I was writing the book and so forth. <clears throat> um, here's the overview from the, from the back of the book. Uh, my daughter, uh, Wendy, our daughter, Wendy, helped me to, to write a lot of this. She helped me to edit the book, um, and she helped me to write the, the overview and the blurb from the back. Steve Carter's first novel, All Cows Run to Park Street, captures uh, Boston's music scene in the late 1960s in its equal parts literary romp, love story, and historical fiction. And the synopsis tells us pretty much what the plot is all about. It's 1968. Jim is an English major at UMass Boston. He's a blues bass player, a poet, and opposed to the Vietnam War, 
When he graduates, he'll lose his draft deferment. So he is considering the Underground Railroad to escape to Canada. Then he meets Eva. Eva was born underground in the Boston subway. Her mother works in the flower shop at Park Street Station. Her father in the information booth. She's 22 and has never been above ground. Together they explore an underground world that spans time and space. As Jim grapples with the possibility of escaping underground, Eva may be ready to go above. And appropriately enough, I also include tonight, oh, there you go. This is Diane Kane's review of my book and I thought it captured the, uh, a lot of the in important details of the book, so I'm gonna read it. Steve Carter's, uh, All Cars Run to Park Street by Steve Carter is a sweet ride. Boston in the late 1960s teemed with soulful blues music in the air, protests and poetry on every street corner, and love lurking in the most unusual places. Carter brings the reader behind the 60s blues, Boston blues scenes and delves deep into the netherland of the underground Boston subway universe. Jim, the main character, is based on Carter's lean college days at UMass Boston when the school was the only thing between him and the draft. Carter's book takes a hard look at the turbulent time in history when the borders of reality and fantasy blurred and anything seemed possible. Jim meets Eva in the busy Park Street station of the Boston T subway. He soon realizes that this is not just a stop for Eva, this is her permanent residence. Jim is contemplating ways of hiding from the draft after graduation, while Eva is deciding if she wants to escape her sheltered life of hiding underground. Can the two worlds coincide? Carter has a bold style of writing that embraces both literary and contemporary prose. All Cars Run to Park Street flows with a comfortable nostalgia intertwined by uncanny mystery, heady history, and tender romance that makes for an enjoyable journey. And thank you to Diane for writing that excellent review. Um, so the, the important things I want to talk tonight about are uh, <clears throat> that there is a sense of mystery because we don't know early in the book who or even what Eva is whether she's real or a figment of Jim's imagination. And I try to maintain that without stating it too clearly all the way through the book, right to the very end. <clears throat> um, there's a lot of history in the book. I spent a lot of time researching the Boston subway and how it was built and the, the explosion on the corner of Tremont Street and Boylston Street where three horses were killed and along with a couple of riders on the trolley and um, the people who are buried in the Granary Burial Ground across the street from the Boston Common right near Park Street. Um, and that brings me to the ghosts. I did a presentation a, a, a couple of months ago at another library and the book club had bought my book and they had read the book and discussed it. And the librarian who, who managed the presentation had not quite, had started reading the book and hadn't been able to finish it. So after I did my presentation and talked to the people who had read the book, the librarian said to one of the people in the book group, you know, when you were talking about ghosts and stuff like that, I was thinking, I scratched my head thinking, are you talking about the same book that I just read? Because I read half the book and there's no ghosts in it. Well, that's the way it works. I use a technique called magical realism in the tradition of uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez and, and uh, Hess's Steppenwolf and, and things like that. And so I... What I do in the first part of the book is try to establish the real part of it and make it as real and true to life as I can. So that's why I took all of that history and tried to cram it in there. Um, and then <clears throat> the magical realism part, in at least the way I view magical realism, it has to transition very smoothly. That It seems perfectly logical that Jim and Eva are a, uh, walking on a platform, Boylston Street platform, late at night, and they open, she lifts up a chain and opens a door and they go down into a back room and all of a sudden they find them. Well, you'll find out. I'll read that passage <laughs> to you. <clears throat> um, so uh, there's, there's all of that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the characters now <clears throat> and then get into the mythology. Okay, what we know about Jim is that <clears throat> he's an English major, a blues bass player, and he's opposed to the war. Uh, He's an English major at UMass Boston. UMass Boston now looks something like this. 
and Marilyn and I have done a couple of events out there, and it's quite a, an impressive uh, campus. Over on the far right there is the JFK Memorial Library. <clears throat> when Jim started at UMass Boston, it looked like this. That was the entire school. In fact, only half of that building, just the front half of the building. Uh, I was in the, oh, I'm sorry, Jim was in the charter class uh, starting in 1965 and was the in the first graduating class of, of that school. Uh, <clears throat> my book is a coming of age among a bunch of other things. It's a coming of age novel. It's about Jim's coming of age, Eva's coming of age, even coming to life of, above ground possibly. Um, <clears throat> but it's also a coming of age of the University of Massachusetts and it's a coming of age of uh, certain phases of the Boston music scene which pretty much didn't exist before that time and still exist today. For example, at that time um, electric blues was pretty much unknown in Boston. If I played, I'm sorry, Jim played in a blues band and uh, the places that blues band played, played were mostly coffee houses. Blues was considered folk music, which in fact it, it is and was. Um, <clears throat> and so just about that time, the 1965, 66, uh, a lot of blues clubs started, started opening up. <clears throat> there are a lot of music stories in the book. Some of them are magical scenes, so those I didn't really take part in. But the ones that happen above ground, well, they are, some of them are underground in like uh, the, the Unicorn Coffee House, uh, which was underground on Boylston Street, not far from Berkeley. Um, but a lot of those scenes that are as true to life as I can remember them, and the characters that I introduce uh, in those scenes are, of course, real characters. I thought of changing the names to protect myself, um, but I decided, what the heck, Van Morrison is not going to call me up and say, you have no right to use my name in the... Um, so I, I talk about the real, the real characters back then. Um, why am I mentioning now, I'm going to talk about an electric bass guitar. Why am I doing that? Well, I'll take an indirect route to that. One of the reasons I wanted to self-publish the book is that I wanted to keep complete creative control over the book. If I went to a traditional publisher, they would decide what was going to be on the cover. And I wanted a cover custom designed. Fortunately, we have a friend, Peter Minton Jr., uh, who has been a friend of the family since he was in high school. And uh, he, I asked him if he would, uh, if he would design my cover. This is a snapshot of his web page. Uh, he does graphic novels. The one on the far right there is part of a series called the, uh, the Monitor's Guild. And it's two books right now. He's working on the third book. And it's based on the American Revolution. So it's like a retelling in contemporary times of the American Revolution. Uh, you can see he does sort of uh, comics and then uh, mysteries. And that uh, young woman on the left over there, that's our daughter, Sherry. Uh, he's, she's his principal model for a lot of the characters in a lot of his books. So I wanted Peter to design my cover. So I gave him the very rough first draft to read and he sent me some sketches and then Marilyn and I looked at them and we made suggestions and he made little changes. <clears throat> and this is the um, this is the graphic that was pretty close to the final version of what you see on the book now. And <clears throat> this is something that very few people do anymore with book covers. Usually a book cover is very simple um, and is just on the front and not much on the back, and the back could be blank. Uh, some authors, Diane Kane, for example, has wraparound um, picture, uh, which is something I like. <clears throat> the spine of the book would be right about here. So, <clears throat> The, obviously, the character carrying that case is uh, Jim. And when uh, Peter first did this, the hair wasn't longy and shaggy enough. So, uh, and so the hair hasn't changed that much. But <laughs> 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 um, 
And of course, that's Eva over there on the left. What I really like, and it's, it's very clear in this picture, not quite so clear on the cover, but there's a shaft of light that comes down from that, uh, the Park Street entrance and goes all the way across to Eva. And I was looking at this recently and I was thinking, you know what, it could be going the other way. It could be light coming out of Eva and going out from below to above, which ties in with the whole plot of the book. I asked Peter to, to get uh, to do some research and try to get as much authenticity as he could. So he researched the Green Line cars and made sure he had one that looked like the 1960s. The tokens are true to life. Um, I wanted a, uh, there's a little passage in the book where there's music coming through at the Park Street Station and those horrible speakers that they had, piped in music. They just started that and then about the time that my book happened. And uh, the quality of the speakers was worse than the ones that are in the ceiling of Kmart. <laughs> and Jim just hates it. So I, I asked Peter on, the, on a later draft to put in. So that's a little speaker there, blasting nasty sounding music. Um, if you look really closely, if you zoom in, which we can't do with the, with this screen, but if you look really closely, the people descending the stairway into Park Street Station and the people waiting at Park Street Under for the trolley looked very ghost-like. Um, <clears throat> uh, this is Jim's base case. Notice down here this little brown patch and there's this little sticker. Uh, I tried to make this as true to life as I could. This is a recent picture from a couple of years ago of that same base case. I still have it. Um, there's the patch and that little sticker is uh, one that my, our daughter Sherry uh, gave to me when she was about three and said, Dad, you have to put this on your base case. I don't even know what it is anymore. It's all faded and white, but it was probably uh, Snoopy or something like that. Um, so that's the, uh, that's the base case that plays a role in the opening of the book. And then inside the base case is Beulah. That's what Jim named his base. Um, it's a very, this is a very unusual base. Again, this is a recent picture. I still have it. I, I used it on the albums we made for uh, No Frit Cooking, and I've used it on all 10 of my, well, not all 10, on many of my uh, solo albums. I multi-track bass and multiple guitar tracks and so forth. And the Ampeg B15 that, that Jim lugs around, I can tell you that thing weighs about 75 pounds. And you'll, in the book, Jim has to carry it up to the, I forget if it's, a, I guess it's the second floor uh, of uh, Grove Street on Beacon Hill. Uh, and uh, I can tell you that I don't, I had somebody take, build me a special case for it so I could take the top off and carry that separately. Um, so I couldn't carry that thing up even one flight of stairs these days. Uh, although I did use it playing gigs up until about, I don't know, eight, nine years ago. Um, okay, Eva, of course, uh, she's born underground, we know that, and uh, here's a close-up of that uh, portion of the, <clears throat> of the cover, and what I, I like about this is the way uh, Peter has captured the, the sense of mystery in the way the tunnel veers off like that. It, to me, it's, it's that part of the cover says, Eva has been down there and knows things that no one else knows. <clears throat> then there's Mr. C. When I started, I guess I haven't mentioned this yet. I came up with the idea for this book. Oh, I, oh by the way, every time I say idea, I hear, when I was teaching at Berkeley, one of my students raised his hand and say, said, Mr. Carter, please, can you say idea instead of idea? <laughs> and I just said no. Um, uh, I got the idea in about 1971, uh, just after Marilyn and I got married, because we come from different religious backgrounds, and there, the families were opposed to the uh, to the marriage. Uh, it all worked out fine, um, but I came up with this idea of uh, a woman trying to escape, um, and a, and a man trying to escape. So her father was Mr. C. I didn't have a name for him. I just picked a letter, Mr. C and Mrs. C. And in my mind, I've been calling them that uh, ever since. Well, it turns out that Mr. C works in the, um, oops, let me see. That's not what I want. This is a, a photograph that I got from the Boston Street Railway Association. Uh, the president of that uh, 
Bradley Clark has been very helpful in my help, helping me research this. And this is the information booth that was in Park Street Station up until probably the 80s or the early 90s. Ironically enough, I played in a what we call a general business band, a, uh, a wedding band, for several years with a guy named Dick Donahue, and his job was that to sit there exactly. And the booth had been remodeled by that time, but he worked in the information booth. Um, so that's um, Mr. C, and I named him Howie Carson. And the reason I did that is because Howie Carson was the engineer of the Boston subway. The Boston subway started as the uh, Boylston and Tremont Street subway and basically went just along those two streets. And that's how it got started. And so I, You'll, you'll meet Mr. Carson in, in a moment here. Uh, the, the guy in the uniform with the hat, I don't know who he is. <laughs> and then there's Mrs. Carson. And you notice she's not in this picture. And I never really describe her, and well, you'll see. But um, this is, a, again, from the Boston Street Railway Association, and that's the flower shop that was in there. Uh, there's a grammatical error on the sign, and that turns up in the book. Um, and the flower shop is near the, the uh, information booth. There's also a, a snack shop, quick foods, a quick shop, or something like that. So as I was researching this, a lot of people online would say, no, there was never an information booth. There was never a flower shop. There was never, okay, well, According to the Boston Street Railway Association, <laughs> um, so that's Mrs. C, and then uh, there's this guy Earl, and I didn't have any idea. I knew that he was a black man, that's all I knew. So I went online and I looked for a picture of just a black man, and I found this. And I said, I don't know who he is. <laughs> I think most people do know who he is. <laughs> now I know who he is. I don't know, he just looked like what I wanted Earl to look like. And then there's Curbstone, and all I'm gonna tell you about Curbstone right now is that Curbstone's a dog. Okay, so now we're gonna to get to characters mythology. Here's Jim again and Eva. <coughs> I use a lot of mythology uh, under, under uh, underground, <laughs> so to speak, uh, in my book. Uh, there are layers and layers uh, going on in the book. There are literary allusions, there are musical allusions, there are allusions to mythology, Egyptian mythology, Greek mythology, Roman mythology, and so forth. So the myth of Orpheus and Eurydice is that Eurydice was the wife of Orpheus, uh, he was the god of music, and uh, while she was dancing in the meadow, she was bitten on the foot by a snake, died and went to the underworld. Orpheus went there to bring her back. Along the way he had a charm, he had to charm the three-headed dog Kerberos who guarded the underworld. Uh, I researched Kerberos a little bit. Some people say that it was actually pronounced Cerberus and others say it was Kerberos and it sometimes it's spelled Kerberos and so forth. Um, so here, this uh, picture of Orpheus is uh, from a statue at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, and there's Orpheus looking uh, for Eurydice, and he's carrying his lyre under his arm, just like Jim is carrying the base case under his arm on the cover, and there's the three-headed dog, uh, Kerberos, and here's Eurydice nursing her bitten foot. Uh, here's Howie and Mrs. Mrs. C. So there's another myth going on here, and that's... Um, Plato and Hades. In Orpheus and Eurydice, Orpheus had to go down and try to bring Eurydice back. And I've read two different endings for that myth, according to which mythologist you read. Um, one is that um, the rule that Pluto, um, the rule that, yeah, Pluto made was that uh, Eurydice could, if Eurydice looked back, she couldn't leave. So as they were going out in one myth, she looks back over her shoulder and goes back to Hades and that's the end of her. In another, she doesn't look back and comes out. Uh, I allude to the Bob Dylan song. She does, she's an artist, she don't look back. And a lot of people say that's a, a, an allusion to this. Well, with uh, Plato, uh, Pluto, uh, Pluto was the god of the underworld, sometimes called Hades. Um, and. Uh, he abducted Persephone and took her to the underworld. She was forbidden to eat in the underworld, but she ate six pomegranate seeds, so could only leave for six months out of the year. 
Uh, the, the story is much more complex than that, of course, and it's what they call a, uh, uh, well, I forget what they call it. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> um, uh, in springtime, the, the earth comes back to life and the crops grow again. In the winter, they die. And so it, it's based on that uh, mythology that there are gods and goddesses and all kinds of battles going on in, in the other world that affect how things grow. So um, uh, I think it was Mercury who came and somehow got uh, Persephone out from under, underground. And then there's uh, U Egyptian uh, mythology. I'm going to talk about Kerberos more in a minute. And um, Earl represents a couple of Egyptian, or not represents, but some of the things that go on with Earl are based on a couple of Egyptian gods. One of them is Thoth. Uh, and he was the god who measured the souls of the dead to see if they were worthy. Um, and he had this device that he carries and some images you see of him. Well, first of all, he has the Ankh, and you notice that from our, the Mott logo. Um, and then he has this thing here, which was called a WAS, W-A-S. And it has a hook on one end and two prongs on the other end. And I have a little quote here from the book. Um, Give me the WAS, that hellhound is on the loose again. So... I'm going to read the, intro, the very beginning of the book is, and kind of talk about how all of this is, is set up in there. One of the challenges I set for myself is to get all of those main characters into the first scene. Uh, they didn't have to do much, but I just wanted them all there. Because I'm a musician, and I, at the, you know, if you're writing a large piece of music, you want to introduce all your themes uh, early. But you'll hide, for, for example, I was going to find the cheap music for this, and I didn't get to it. But Leonard Bernstein points out in the Beethoven Sixth Symphony, um, the melody is going, do 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 da 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 And underneath it, the, the cellos are going, ba well, the, after the violins finish with ba 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 da 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 what do they do? ba da da which is the inversion of what the cellos just played. So that's the way the musicians set up um, themes and, and develop them. So ideas like inversion, which is a musical term, and, and uh, retrograde and, and all that sort of thing are littered all through the book in, in Jim's interior monologue. <coughs> So <clears throat> let me see if I can uh, get you through the first couple of paragraphs here. The wind caught Jim's base case, nearly blowing it out of his hand, pulling him down the icy slope of the Boston Common toward Charles Street. He pulled back on the case, upended it, and hugged it to his chest out of the wind's grasp. Beulah must think I'm on my way to school, he thought, trying to take me down the long path toward Park Square. He's got a re we've got a rehearsal to go to, Beulah. I want to talk for a second about technique there. Um, I use uh, interior monologue a lot in the book. And I start here in a very traditional way by saying, he thought, because that makes the transition. When you get to the se second, par uh, second paragraph, Bueller must think I'm on my way to school. You don't know who Bueller is. You don't know who's talking here. You don't know what's going on, but uh, he, whoever it is is referring to himself. Uh, so later on, I dropped the he thoughts and the, all of the transitional stuff, and I dropped it pretty early in the book. So some readers have said they found that a little confusing. It's a technique that James Joyce and Virginia Woolf were using well over 100 years ago, uh, but it's not a very common um, technique to use these days. Uh, he turned, oh, uh, one more thing, the long path. Uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, who is credited with coming up with the idea of, of calling Boston the hub of the universe, um, that long path is, is named for him, and that's where he met his wife-to-be, and he said to her, will you walk the long path with me? And so that gets dribbled through the book, too. That kind of reference comes through. Um, he turned left and headed down the short path towards P Park Street Station. A woman walked slowly in front of him, a large paper cup in one hand, a pretzel in the other, rhythmically dipping the pretzel into the cup and biting off soggy bits. Jim hurried past her. Two massive granite kiosks emerged out of the foggy November night. 
They looked like mausoleums in spite of the dim light that drifted from windows near the top. They housed the two entrances to Park Street Station. The Peter got the light coming in the window of the mausoleum on the cover. Jim scurried past the first kiosk. As he approached the kiosk at the corner of Tremont and Park, he returned the base case to carrying position. The handle of the case was positioned off-center so that one end hung lower, the tilt facilitating going up and down stairs without bumping one end of the case against the steps. For the descent down the stairs to the subway, he made sure the low end was in front so the case would follow the slope of the stairs. So not only am I providing detailed information about this base case that's going to be busy, get carried around a lot in the book, I'm introducing the idea of above and below. It's, uh, Eva's family refers to anything out of Park Street, everything above ground is above. And Eva, uh, as she's growing up, she can ride the subway trains, but she has to get off at the last stop before the train goes above ground. So for example, in Kenmore Square, if you take the, the green line from Park Street Station and you head out towards Brookline, you have to get off at Kenmore Square or the train, the next stop is above ground. Uh, so she couldn't, um, she couldn't go past Kenmore Square, which strangely enough is where the Ratskeller uh, Rock and Roll Club was, which is where Jim played. Uh, there were two rooms in the Rat Ratskeller when you win the, f the first floor. Uh, there was a little room in the back that was called the Blue Illusion, and then you went down the stairs, the very sticky stairs, and uh, down to the low underground room with very sticky floors. We went there, uh, I don't know, 15 years ago or something to hear a band, and that floor was just as sticky as it was <laughs> in 1965. Um, but uh, so uh, Eva has to turn around and go back whenever she gets to Kenmore Square. Well. I remember going, I'm sorry, Jim remembers going down the stairs uh, in, to the Kenmore Square subway station and seeing a sign that said, all cars run to Park Street. And I asked the people online about this. I asked all of everybody I had in contact. Nobody remembers it, but I remember it. And someday I'm going to find somebody who has a picture of it, but I haven't found it yet. Uh, and of course, that ties in with the hub that Mr. C thinks that Park Street Station is the hub of the hub. It's the hub of the universe. And if you look at a Boston uh, subway map, all, car, all the lines do seem to go to Park Street. OK. Um, now we'll meet Mr. C. Oh, no, we have to meet Curbstone next. This is the next thing to happen. <coughs> Only one of the doors of the subway entrance was open. The descent beckoned, but across the opening lay a black and white dog, actually a black and gray dog, the white obscured by grime, a homely and probably homeless mutt, though someone had tied three colorful bandanas around his neck. As Jim approached, the dog growled and bared its teeth. Jim stopped short. The dog barked. Jim contemplated whether he should change his plan and walk down Tremont Street to the subway entrance at the corner of Tremont and Boylston. His contemplation was interrupted when the dog leaped up and snapped at the air a few feet before him, a few feet from him. Jim jumped back, but he had not been the target of the dog's attack. Something had flown through the air and into the dog's mouth. Jim noticed a familiar smell. In an instant, he knew what it was, what the smell was, beer. That should shut you up for a while, doggy, he heard a voice say from over his shoulder. The woman Jim had hurried past, now without press pretzel sauntered past Jim and started down the stairs. So I've introduced uh, Curbstone, Kerberos, guarding the entrance to Hades. And uh, in the myth, uh, Orpheus first has to charm the rocks and the trees to get them out of the way to find the entrance to Hades. And then he, has, then he encounters Kerberos, the three-headed dog, who we'll, we'll meet in a few minutes. You see a, a little picture of him there. Um, and he charms him by playing the lute. Well, I thought that would be kind of, if Jim took out his bass and started playing, no, that wasn't going to work. That happens later. Um, okay, so 
Now we meet Mr. C, just the next page. At the bottom of the stairs, he shifted the base case to his left hand, reached into his right pocket, took out a token, dropped it into the slot, and pushed through the turnstile. As he passed the information booth, the attendant, his sweater buttoned up, his pressed white shirt buttoned and secured by a drab tie, his thinning hair slicked down, scowled at him through his heavy-rimmed glasses, focusing his scowl first on Jim's shoulder-length hair, then on his base case. Jim wanted to walk up to him and say, Yeah, that's right, mister. I'm a damn hippie college kid, and I know you're thinking this big suitcase is full of drugs. Instead, he looked at the clock on the back of the booth above the man's head. Ten of six, that should give me enough time to get to the Webster House in time for rehearsal. So the Webster House, as I said, is where I, I met Marilyn. And uh, the Blues Children, I, who I've used as real people in the book, uh, was a five-piece band. And uh, we would rehearse at the, uh, <clears throat> at the Webster House. We played Wednesday, Friday, Saturday nights. And we all, well, I was in school and the other guys worked day jobs. So the only time we could rehearse was to... Uh, to go in early on a Friday or a Saturday night and to rehearse before the first set. So and that was a very common thing to happen in, in Boston in those days. And, <clears throat> you know, today, uh, if you go downtown Dover, for example, and you go to the Brick House, sometimes there'll be four or five bands playing it at night and they'll do one set each. And it's, it's very rare to have a steady gig anymore. Um, so we would go in on Wednesday night set up our equipment, I would lug in that heavy amplifier, we would set up the equipment, and then at the end of the night, we'd take our instruments, and leave our equipment on the stage, and take our instruments, go home, Friday night, we'd come back with our instruments, plug in to the, to the amps and everything that nobody had touched, they just sat there on the stairs, on the stage. Uh, so that's the way we worked out rehearsing at, at that point. Um, Mrs. C, again, very slight mention here. A green line car had just pulled out, so Jim joined the small crowd at the edge of the track to await the next one. He turned the base case on end and rested his arm on the top. On the other side of the tracks, the quick snack shop and the flower shop were closing, a woman standing in front of each, rolling down metal shutters. Uh, Mrs. C gets, gets uh, to play some important roles later in the book. Um, let's talk for a moment about Curbstone. As I mentioned in the book, he's a three-legged dog. And uh, I did a little bit of research on uh, Kerberos, the, the god dog from Greek mythology. And that's a, a snapshot, a little snippet from that statue we saw with Orpheus in Kerberos. And you notice the three collars on the three heads. And it uh, doesn't look too vicious. But there are lots of um, statues and so forth uh, of Kerberos. Here's another one now. He has three chains or a chain in three different loops. Again, the, the three heads. And some artists interpret Kerberos is being a little more vicious looking, like that. This is a bronze statue. These are from different museum and websites. And then others uh, make him even more threatening, uh, maybe some kind of a bulldog or something. Uh, and then and getting more and more threatening. And this to me is the, the most threatening of all. And it doesn't show up. Uh, great on this screen, but it's a metal sculpture. So I asked, after um, I published the book, I wanted a picture of Kerberos to use in this presentation, Kerbstone. And so I went to Peter, I asked Peter, would you draw me a picture of Kerbstone, however you see him, uh, do whatever you want. Uh, before I get to that, I want to do one more thing. I want to set the... Uh, just to set something up. One of the things I like about this uh, cover is the way that Peter used co color. The purple on Jim's shirt and these, I'm, 
My grandson tells me that I'm colorblind. He insists that I'm colorblind. He, when he was a kid, like when he was younger, like every week he would he would give me a color test, you know, and I was supposed to name the colors. As soon as I got into the blue greens and the orange reds, and I, I was terrible. Anyway, this kind of crimson or whatever it is here, and this orange, um, they cr they occur over here too, I guess, suggesting hellfire. And there's this central figure over here um, that's very purple. And then there's a little more, there's a lot of purple down here. So I'm going to come back to that in a minute, but I forgot to mention one other thing that I find entertaining here. Um, this is an early draft of the cover, and you notice that a guitar pick, it says Fender Heavy. So I have enough to worry about with Van Morrison trying to sue me for mentioning. So I said to Peter, why don't we just kind of obscure that Fender logo so that I don't get a phone call from the lawyers at Fender saying, we didn't r give you a, an acknowledgement of your book, so you can't use that. Um, so now when we go to, there it is. Isn't that a vicious looking Kerberos? <laughs> um, <clears throat> Uh, Peter wrote to me, he sent me this uh, graphic, and it, uh, he said, uh, okay, sorry about that. Um, those oranges and pinks and purples or whatever they are, uh, he worked them, he said, he wrote back to me and he said, I took some liberties with the three scarves. Remember from the introduction that he had the three scarves around his neck, which was something that was very popular with the, among the hippies in the 60s. Uh, so he just kind of, made them a little bit vague there, but it's really the only color in the picture and it really draws your eye into, into that. And I think it resonates nicely with the, the cover. He said this background, he was in a, I think he was in a subway somewhere or a bus station and there was a crumbling granite walls with some of the metal coming through. So he used that as the background. And I, the thing that the thing that I like best about this is the eyes. Eyes are very difficult to draw. Eyes and hands, most artists agree, are among the most difficult things to draw. And <clears throat> to my eye, anyway, um, this eye, his right eye, uh, is very soft and welcoming. Whereas that eye, if you look at it just by itself, is not quite, it's not quite the same. So I think it's just a little hint in there of uh, the, the Kerberos from mythology. So I'm going to read a brief passage now that we know a little bit more about uh, all these characters. <clears throat> this happens pretty, pretty far into the book. As I say, I spent most of the first part of the book setting up the story and the characters. And uh, <clears throat> this is one of the very earliest uh, magical scenes. And I'll talk about how I worked in the... Uh, mythology. Um, the chapter begins like this. Jim and Eva waited until the midnight hour, then re took the red line from... Par of course, that's another musical illusion. Uh, one of the bands, the songs that my band was playing every night, every night we played at the Webster House was Wilson Pickett, The Midnight Hour. Uh, so Eva says that she's going to take Jim to dinner. Well, he knows that she can't go above ground, where can you eat dinner in the, in the subway? The quick snack shop closes early at night, and they wait until midnight, so they're going to go to dinner somewhere. Um, the next, uh, so they go, first they go to the underground at uh, the old Broadway station, which is still there. The old underground Broadway station is still there, and it's different from the, uh, the, the one that we know the, above, uh, above it. And there's a video on um, YouTube of the Boston Street Railway and other people leading a tour through the abandoned tunnels in, um, uh, in Boston. Uh, so that's where they go. And then the next night, uh, they, turned, they turned down the stairway to Park Street Station, noticing that Curbstone was not on uh, I'm sorry, he turned, let me back up. Jim turned down, uh, trotted down the stairway to Park Street Station, noticing that Curbstone was not on duty at the entrance. He deposited a quarter into the turnstile and saw Eva. Did you notice, by the way, that was a quarter and not a token? Uh, that's deliberate because the, um, 
in December of 1968, they switched over from tokens in the subways to, to quarters. And it was a big hullabaloo in Boston. There were big articles in the newspaper. Everybody was up in arms. Oh, this is outrageously expensive. And, then, and earlier in the book, uh, Jim and his uh, roommate are sitting in a bar talking about life and uh, and uh, his roommate says to him, well, Jim, at least you've got music. And Jim says, yeah, uh, that and 20 cents will get me on the subway. Well, then immediately it becomes 25 cents. Um, you remember the song, Charlie on the MTA? Well, that was one of those times when they raised the, um, they raised the price by a nickel. And Charlie is still there as far as I know. Um, <clears throat> So Jim saw Eva walk out from behind a pillar, smiling at him. As he walked over to her, a green line car pulled up. Eva said, hi, dinner is this way, and they climbed onto the car. They rode in silence to Boylston, except for the deafening squeal and screech of the trolley's wheels as it rounded the curve approaching Boylston Street Station. When the car stopped, Eva again said, dinner is this way, and led him out of the car and down to the far end of the platform. A thin metal chain hung between two chrome railings that led down a few steps from the platform to the dirt patch with a door to the right. A small sign on the wall next to the railings read, Danger, no passing. Eva touched one end of the chain where it was attached and it fell away. She stepped aside and motioned for Jim to walk down the steps. Seeing, this, seeing his glance at the sign, she said, Don't worry, there's no danger. Jim's thoughts began to pinwheel. Jane doesn't stop people, sign either. It's the fear of the darkness beyond. No third rail here, but that's a known danger. The other dangers, scarier. Bats, rats, subway microbes, a cockroach scurrying across a discarded candy wrapper would survive nuclear war, not fear that they are down here. Extra protection, unfair advantage. They followed the dirt path beside the tracks. As they rounded a curve, the front end of a trolley car came into view. Beneath the duck-billed monitor roof was an open platform where a conductor would stand, but there was no conductor. The car was parked on the track, looking at as, as if it had never moved and never would. So this is one of the scenes where there actually is an old trolley car in the Boylston Street station, um, but that's not this one. This is a, a trolley car which I describe in detail, I won't go into now, um, from the uh, early 1900s. And so they go into the trolley car and there's a, a, a plate of food there with cheese and glass of, and bottle of wine and all of this stuff. And um, so Eva says, uh, enjoy, and they reach across the aisle and clink their wine glasses together and, and say in unison, cheers. They ate the meal in silence from time to time, glancing across the aisle at each other. Jim watched how Eva spread butter on her bread, taking great care to spread it evenly, all the way to the crust. He watched as she savored the crimson seeds and creamy pith of the fruit. The gold light of the flickering gas lamps reflected off, off her hair. Eva seemed to feel his stare, turned to him and said, What? Jim smiled, raised his glass and said, Thanks for dinner. But what was that fruit? Pomegranate. That's where I work in that, the pomegranate story. Oh, okay. I think I've covered everything I want to cover. I'm sure you have.